so welcome back uh, to uh, the session of this workshop on verified learning and autonomy in CPS. And uh, this last session is going to be a, a bumper crop of five presentations, uh, uh, all very exciting. And to kick them off, uh, we have Professor Chu Chu Fan from MIT. And uh, just to keep things short, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do full introductions. So, you know, but Chu Chu has done amazing work at the interface of all the topics of this workshop. So, excited to have you here, Chu Chu, and please go ahead. Thank you. Thanks uh, for this, uh, for inviting me here. And it's a great pleasure uh, to see all of you and share some of our, our recent research progresses on building certifiably safe and correct large-scale autonomous system. And the talk, like the, the update I really want to share with you uh, today is about uh, some of the data-driven methods or machine learning methods we have used in automatic control problems. So, um, Okay, so like uh, th this this picture I'm showing here is one of the simulation environments that we have built in the past two years here at my lab at M MIT about a future city that we want to live in, and the, you probably have seen some sort of some some white dots. They are they are drones. We want to see whether we can put really a lot a lot of them, like thousands of them, in the city to, for example, help us deliver our packages. And we can also put ground vehicles to manage the transportation and all that autonomous robots or autonomous systems that we wish to have in our future life. And um, of course, uh, there. Are, a lot of uh, significant challenges to be addressed before we can really have safe autonomous system. Although a lot of like places, a lot of companies are promising fully autonomous vehicles, but we always see this constant accidents and sometimes deadly, a deadly accident that sort of make us wonder, uh, it, can we use some of the rigorous mathematics that we learned from, for example, control theory and machine learning to help address some of the challenges in building a safe autonomous system? And of course, this is a challenging problem that many of us are looking at. And uh, the, among these challenges, the ones I'm primarily looking at in the last few, two day, two years was about the following three. First, how to deal with a really a large number of the, the agents, how to deal with high dimensional system in the sense that the state and the input space like extremely high dimension. And what about like uncertainties? What if we don't have a precise model for the system or for the environment? Can we still give some sort of guarantees in this case? So there are like control has been studied for a really long time and there being there have been a lot of fantastic methodologies being developed to address safe control problems all the way from from like the very um very classical optimal control or optimization based control to uh today's hot topic in reinforcement learning or constrained reinforcement learning where uh, we people look at reinforcement learning with safety guarantees i would say that when we were using these methods in to solve some of our problems we sort of have to always make a trade-off between the assurance level this method can provide versus the scalability for example classical optimal control and optimization based control they can give us pretty high assurance level in a sense we know the here is a model here's a method and if we get the answer the answer is definitely going to be correct it, the closed loop system will be hit behave in the way that we want and well on the other side reinforcement learning uh it can it can scale better to a lot a large number of the agents to scale to quite complex problem like we can have perception input or you can help like play some sort of a games but reinforcement learning on the other side is hard to interpret what's the thing that we really learned and robust mpc uh, it's some, somewhere in the middle, in a sense, it's still better than traditional optimal control, but there are still certain things we cannot prove, like um, like reaching the goals on time, like liveness properties is hard to prove using uh, MPC. And definitely this is not a uh, exclusive list. There are many other approaches that we can place on this on this. Uh, um, on these two axes, like somewhere uh, here and there. But what I 
I want to what, what we are studying is something called the neuro certificate based control. And we, what, what we want to show and what we are working on is that can we break the tie here to achieve both a good assurance level and a good scalability to a large number of the agents. So that's so this like hopefully by the end of like my report today, you uh, you will be convinced a little bit that this is a pretty promising approach that worth looking at. So when I say certificate, what I really mean is the control certificate that we sort of draw an idea from control theory. To be more specific, there are like uh, ty three types of functions that we are looking at, like uh, the Yapon function that can certify the stability of a fixed point or equilibrium point. A barrier function, that's like a, a generalized Lyapunov theory where we can certify the invariance of a region. And if this invariance we can prove is it's like containing the safe region, then we can somehow prove safety using barrier function. And finally, contraction metric is sort of like a differentiable Lyapunov function, but the, the purpose here is to certify the capability to attract any trajectory instead of a fixed point. And this is especially useful for us to design the controller for the quadrotors. In a sense, uh, if we design certain path for the quadrotor, we want it to be able to track it, even with like a huge wind or some other external disturbances. And contraction metric can uh, work better if we give an arbitrary trajectory for the, uh, for the quadrotor to, to to track then the Lyapunov based approach. Anyway, these three, they, although they have different names, they can certify different kind of properties. They are uh, they are actually like very, they, they are all some type of Lyapunov analysis. So I will just use one of them to give you an example. Uh, I believe like most of you are quite familiar with barrier functions, but this is really just a simple scalar function that map the state to a scalar value where and we call this function h now we don't know what this h is represented uh how this is represented you we can come up with different function form to represent it and handcrafted one but we do know that h should satisfy the following three constraints for a state that are safe we want the value of h is non-positive it has to be less or equal to zero for states that's uh, not safe and we, we <coughs> want the value of H to be positive. Now you can see that H equals to zero sort of give us a barrier in a sense, like we want H to always stay negative. So we stay in safe. That's why it's called a barrier function. And the third uh, constraint here is really saying that we want the derivative of H to somehow always decrease to make sure that we, once we're inside safe, we always stay within safe. So these are pretty straightforward three three constraints. And again, we can use like any function form like a, a polynomial or, or a linear function to represent H and make sure H satisfies these three constraints on us in a state space. Unfortunately, like before neural certificates, finding H itself is a very challenging problem. Um, like it's it's as challenging as finding a Lyapunov function. We all know that there's no general applicable approach to find a Lyapunov function for any for any system. Uh, fortunately, in 2019, a group of researchers from UCSD, Sean Gao and uh, her, his students, they sort of, they, uh, and uh, they're, at the same time, there are some uh, similar work appeared at different places where here, I think Sean's work is quite representative. Uh, he showed us that uh, Lyapunov functions, barrier functions, they can all be represented as a neural network. And we can represent the controller at the same time. So we're actually looking at a control barrier function or control Lyapunov function. We can represent both the certificate and the controller as neural networks and find the weights of the neural network by solving the following lost term. And this lost term is very straightforward. It's like there are three items here and they're just really making sure the three constraints at the top is sat are satisfied. For example, the first one is saying we want H to be negative for say states that are safe. If not, we will penalize the case when H is positive in safe. Second thing, second and third terms are almost the same. So it's a very straightforward way of encoding the lost term to penalize the 
violation of the top constraints. And really what we're doing is just to use one neural network to represent the variable function and another neural network to represent the controller. Of course, you can use one neural network to merge those but have separate outputs. That's like just a technical detail. And we train, we draw training samples from the state space. We don't need to run the system, just look at the state space and jointly optimize these two neural networks using this last term that I listed at the top. Very straightforward way, but it actually works pretty well. I can show you two cases. In the middle here is a robot navigation problem where the pink areas are obstacles, and this blue curve is the barrier that we have learned. You can see that the barrier, you, in this case, even if like the safe region is non-convex, it actually aligns pretty well with obstacles. So we know that if we use this control barrier function, if the system is like on the other side of the barrier, meaning they are not colliding with the obstacle, they will not most likely won't collide with obstacle. On the right-hand side is another example or on um, satellite control. So basically there is one satellite in the middle. It's itself is orbiting, but we just, just look at it as the origin of the of this coordination coordinate. Then there's another satellite that's trying to orbit around uh, the, the center one. And the constraint here is that we want we don't want the orbiting one to get too close to the center one, but it doesn't, we don't want it, we don't want it to fly away. So this um this orbiting satellite should be should stay within this ring area um, between these two purple rings and ultimately converge to the ring area that between the two green rings. And we can see that this is a learned, actually this is a learned barrier Lyapunov function at the same time. We can see that first of all, it will never get across the uh, blue barrier. So it will never get too close. It will never fly away. And eventually it will converge to the dark area, meaning uh, this the orbiting satellite will go to the green, the, the ring between the two green region. So what I'm showing here is like the simple idea of a neuron certificate, neural barrier function can really work for non-convex case and for some, some interesting safety constraints. But this is not like going to solve the large scale. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Can you, can you go to the previous slide? Yes. Um, so this went a little fast, but... Um... Uh -huh. Uh, you previously had a characterization of uh, control barrier functions as uh, in terms of constraint, right? As constraint optimization. And now uh, yeah. in, the, in the next slide, you kind of uh, move this into, you know, you, you moved everything into a single loss function. Yeah. And, and then I guess the idea was you're going to jointly train neural networks. So jointly synthesize both the neural control and the neural barrier function with this loss function, right? Exactly. And I, guess, I guess what I'm missing a little bit is the connection between the constraint formulation and the loss function formulation. Like why is, why does the latter imply the former? Oh yeah, so uh, sure. So, sorry that I went I went a little bit fast to the here. So here, like the last term is just the addition of three different terms. If you look at the first term, it says for all the states in act uh, in safe, we we sort of have this last term of the maximum of zero and h. So if h is negative, then is this part this term becomes zero, and if it positive, meaning it violates the first constraint we will penalize that positive term. And so that's like sort of encoding the first constraint. And second constraint is similar. Uh, we want to penalize the case when H is negative in unsafe. And the last term is just saying, we want to penalize the case when H dot is going to increase. So that's the way of encoding the three constraints here. And it, we can show that if this last term converge to zero, then at least all these top three constraints are going to be satisfied on all the sampling points. But what if so it doesn't? Yeah, so like we, uh, there are a couple of, of course, like in machine learning, everything can happen. We need to deal with the case when it doesn't really converge to zero. Uh, first, there, there are a couple of observations. First of all, uh, in, 
some in our training, instead of using a zero here, we sometimes use a more negative value to push it even more to the to to satisfy the constraints and make sure like if um like this only hold for all the finite samples, but we wanted to hold on the other states that we didn't sample, so we can make change the zero to a more negative value. So that's why technique we can do. And another uh, another observation we had was even if this loss term doesn't converge to zero like perfectly, normally it converge to a very small value. And if even if um, I didn't have the pictures here, but I can send you more pictures. Even if this loss term doesn't converge like actually to zero, we can still have this uh, conditions to hold almost everywhere. And there are theories on like almost the optimal function, so something like that to show even if the condition doesn't hold everywhere, you, we still have the convergence and the safety guarantee. So that's sort of the, the hope where we have to uh, to make sure like this really work, even if like machine learning is not going to convert to exact zero. But usually for the cases we we have tried to convert to a pretty, pretty you know, small value. And violation is very minor in certain uh, tiny area. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I move forward? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. So I was talking about these two examples and this simple idea of encoding both the controller and the certificates as neural networks and jointly train them. Now, is it going to solve like a large scale problem? The, like, I mean, the answer is definitely no. Even if we use neural networks, we cannot give the hope that a neural network can give us everything. I want to use a very simple toy example to illustrate this idea of decentralize the certificate functions and why we want to decentralize it, how to decentralize it. Now, what I'm showing here is like I have five cars, there are five, sorry, four cars, four Dobbins cars that are tracking some sort of a uh, eight kind of shape. And for now, in this example, I'm not deploying any collision avoidance controller. They are just a, a tracking controller. And uh, this, this uh, cars, this, uh, it's a ground vehicle uh, dynamics. They will track their own path, but they don't know how to avoid each other. When they get too close, their color will change to blue, meaning they're like, they're, they could be a collision to each other or to the bottom. My question is, can we just use that idea of a neural barrier function to find a safe controller for this? The answer is yes, but also no. In a sense, if we want to design a barrier function, like naively using the, the, the approach I just described, we have to design a centralized one, a big one. And this big one, of course, if we can find one, we can ensure the collision avoidance behavior between agents. But it's not really a good idea for a couple of reasons. First of all, a big centralized one is like kind of difficult to find. I have four agents here. What if I have 4,000 agents? Am I supposed to find a barrier function that can take the state of 4,000 uh, agents and ensure like output a scalar value to ensure safety? And this is not going to generalize what like if I have 4,000 that one agent had, do I have to find a new barrier certificate? Of course we don't. The centralized one is not a good idea. Another another uh, like challenge we have is ultimately these controllers that we learn, it's going to be deployed locally on, the, on each of the agent. The agent won't have a global picture of all the other states. So it's not a realistic assumption to use a centralized barrier function. Each of the agent will only observe a sort of a limited uh, neighborhood of itself. And this neighborhood information itself is a time varying information. So the number of neighbors each agent can have, if we have a draw a sort of a circle called the sensing range, the number and the permutation of the neighboring agent will also change. We need to figure out a way to encode this changing information. So this is going to be a difficult problem if we use, for example, polynomials to describe uh, a barrier function. How would we design a polynomial function that can take in input that is changing? I, I mean, the length of the input and the permutation of the input will also change. So to address these two challenges, first of all, instead of using a centralized barrier function, we will design a decentralized one. The decentralized one, I'm listing the constraints here, but it's really exactly the same as the previous barrier function that I uh, described except that now the input is not just the state information. This is decentralized. So there is a HI for each of the agent and it will take in the local state information XI and OI is the input or observation. For example, this can OI can be a measurement of the LIDAR arrays directly reflected by the 
by the beams. Um, so that's a decentralized barrier function. Other than that, everything looks like. So uh, are the HIs the same for all the component vehicles? If, if they have the same dynamics, it's the same for them. I, I will show you how it looks like. The reason we want to decentralize it is that is exactly with, is that we don't want to find one HI for each agent. If they have the sh same dynamics, we will just give them the same one. But if their dynamics change, like there is a there is a fully actuated actuated car versus an underactuated car, we we cannot use the same H. I mean, we probably can use the same H, but the controller is definitely not not going to be the same. Um, and what we uh so. This is a decentralized barrier certificate, and what we it doesn't mean we lose the global safety constraint. If we just take the maximum of all the decentralized barriers CBFs, we still have a global barrier certificate. So this big this H uh, by taking the maximum of all the small uh, barrier certificates is really a, a barrier certificate for the whole system, and it's there. We don't have to. Uh, purposely constructed when we design a system, but it, we know it's there. So it can kind of give us some sort of assurance. And that's the first challenge. We don't want to centralize one, we want to decentralize it. And the second challenge is time varying observation, like the LiDAR input. And here we actually just use a very, um, a very popular idea in machine learning to encode the changing input into a fixed length vector. And the, the, this trick here, this only trick here we are using is this max thing. This, this there, there's a shape called max. That's a max polling layer. It's a very popular technique in, in computer vision and uh, some of the language processing work to encode the uh, changing input into a fixed length input by back, by doing the max polling as the last layer of the of the neural network and make and change this. OI to be a fixed length vector to send to H. So that's the trick sort of we, we sort of have used here to encode the observation. With these two, we actually now can just use the same idea of representing one decentralized bear, uh, rep represent the decentralized bear certificate as a neural network, the decentralized control as another neural network, add the max pooling layer to make sure the changing OI won't change you know, won't change uh, too much of like the, the output and we're done. But before that, I also want to show you one benefit of using this observation embedding. This observation embedding can actually enable another thing. So usually when we do like a sort of control system design for a cyber physical system, we have the plant and we separately design a sensor, sensing system, and a perception system to do state estimation. The state estimation information will be sent back to the state-based uh, state controller to do the control. And what people, if we want to certify this entire system, what people usually do is to assume that state estimation module with the perception algorithm will always give us a good state estimation. In a sense, we have an error bond on the state estimation error or even if it's not bonded we at least have an idea of the we have to assume some sort of a distribution of the state estimation but we all know that perception you ask a perception to give like a guaranteed estimation of the state information with bonded error itself is very difficult we like that's what the machine learning people have sort of trying to uh trying to really uh to to study this problem and the reason we have to have a um, bounded state estimation error assumption here is that usually the sensing and perception modules, they are not really like straightforwardly differentiable for backpropagation. So we cannot, it's, it's difficult to do backpropagation when we do controllers to do backpropagation all the way from control input to like the observation. Now, uh, it ended up being like there are two communities studying cyber physical systems. There are control community looking at the top to do the control uh, algorithm. And there's like a general machine learning community. They are only looking at the bottom. They are looking at designing the perception algorithm. But if we have this uh, a varying like observation-based encoding, we can actually do that can enable backpropagation all the way to the sensing input. Now we can find a barrier function and a control and the Lyapunov functions directly for LiDAR-based control. So the controller directly takes in the arrays 
from the LiDAR beam and um, output the uh, command to the actuator. So we sort of don't separately uh, don't separately design this perception as state-based controller, instead use a perception-based controller. And we're still able to find um, barrier functions and Lyapunov functions without making any assumptions on the bounded state estimation error. And that's another benefit of this, this observation coding or observation embedding idea. Now, uh, I want to, yeah. You, uh, by perception-based control, are you talking about this like end-to-end -end control here? It's, it's sort of end-to-end -end control, but it's just the LiDAR based. Uh, I We haven't really figured out a way to do like a video based control. This is just LiDAR based. Uh huh. Yeah. So, like, to to be able to do the propagation, we still need to handle some some problems here. But um, like, but I, I would be happy to talk about. Sorry, it is lidar point cloud to control the inputs. Right? This. So this is directly lidar beam. We have like a number of arrays that will be directly sent back to the uh to the controller. Sorry, got it. We are not even constructing the like, the point cloud. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so I want to show you some some uh, quickly show you some some of the results on this idea of training a decentralized barrier certificate. So the training environment here is just an empty space with four agents randomly running to different places, and the controller jointly learned with a decentralized barrier certificate can avoid the collisions automatically. So on the left it was the original scenario, and on the right is the uh, is the is the case when we put this um, decentralized barrier certificate on top of the original tracking controller? You can see that when they get close, they actually nicely know how to avoid each other, and this is fully decentralized. So they they don't know where they are when they are far away from each other. And we actually do a little bit sort of a stress test. We train with eight agents. They they all have the same dynamics, and we put the same controller on. An arbitrary number of them. Like we for the left one is 32 of them going to some sort of a square uh, formation. All the way to the right, we put 1,024 1, cars in the in this in this space where they go to their destination. Um, and one sort of uh like assumption I made here, which I didn't explicitly write in the slide, is the sort of the density of this vehicle is roughly the same from training. We cannot just train with like a super sparse uh, environment and put a controller to like super dense the environment. Then the training won't be sufficient enough to capture all the possible observations. But if the density is roughly the same, then we can see that all these agents, they know how to avoid each other when they go to their destination. What I like really like about the left is you can really see that what the decentralized barrier certificate learned is a virtual roundabout. Uh, when the agent got closed in the center, they sort of rotate in the same direction to uh, unlock this deadlock. We can do the same thing for drones, for 3D cases, 3D vehicles. Um, the 3D case is actually easier because we have another degree of freedom to put the quad rotors. And if you wonder like how that uh, decentralized barrier of certificate, how, how that learned one looks like, if we just plot the value of the decentralized barrier certificate here, we can see that it's really learning a signed distance function, which align with what we wanted to learn, right? In both the two cases, the barrier function will ask the vehicle to go to the unsafe area. So the top one will be the grayer area, the bottom one will be the more blue area. So that's really what we have learned. And uh, this is a control barrier function. So it can tell us how to find, guide the uh, synthesis of a controller to make this possible. And like, like sign distance function, it's just the function. We ha you have to separately uh, design a controller. So this is what we actually learned. I want to say that because like these three, um, these three uh, certificate functions, they are they are more or less the based on Lyapunov theory. So they can all be learned using the same 
uh, framework I just mentioned. We have the neural certificate, we have a neural policy, train them together using a lost function that encode the constraints in the same way. Of course, this certificate itself is learned from finite samples. We still have to verify it is true everywhere. Here we can use like neural network verification techniques or SMT solvers to verify the uh, the, have to verify the certificates and then use that to prove desired properties. This learned policy is directly used in close loop with the plant and, and, uh, and we also have techniques to monitor and adapt to some you know, the, the system to change the environment. The certificate can be reused if the, the uh, change is not too significant, then we can still use a control barrier function or control the function that we have learned to find a new or update the control policy to make sure the system can sort of um, uh, adapt to the new environment. And if I show you some like a qualitative result, the left one is the a drone flying in a really dense environment of ours and the, the rest of our approach, the rest of three are reinforcement learning approaches. And um, I, I'm not sure how smooth this video is on your side. I know sometimes that there is there some latency, but in our, our case, it's the only case when the quadrilateral can nicely avoid all the collisions. We also try this on um, the boats. Boats is a very interesting system to control because it has a very large inertia. Reinforcement learning apparently is not very good at like handling all this huge inertia. And we can see that in our case, we can, the, the there are, this is a super long valley with 1000 boats here. And the, this, this red one will try to avoid all the collisions. The other ones, they may be static or they may move. But if I want to, if I show you some of the qualitative results, First of all, I want to show that this approach can give us a better or much better sampling efficiency. In a sense, we only need 10% of the training samples to get a barrier certificate and a controller that give us 100% safety rate. Uh, versus re reinforcement learning, you can see they need a lot more samples, but the safety rate is roughly around 50%. And they said the safety rate is like the, the number of collision trajectories, more all the trajectories. Oh, one, one minute left. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Let me like uh, let me wrap up very quickly. And we also have a good error tolerance in the sense, even if our uh, the model we used to train is different than the one that I the slightly different, like has an error from the original accurate one, we can still have a pretty good safety tolerance rate. And again, uh, ver uh, in terms of safety rate and task completion rate, meaning we want all the agents to be able to reach their destination on time, you can see our approach is probably the only one that can achieve both. While the other re reinforcement learning based approaches, they sort of have to sacrifice here and there. Uh, I will skip the rest of it, like some other examples to show we can find a certified controller for the F-16 model from the Air Force Research Lab and actually outperform most of the machine learning based approaches. They actually give us very ridiculous behavior, like spinning the, like let the fighter craft spin really, uh, really fast, uh, or they can never reach the, the waypoint. So. There, we also try to add, uh, insert this to some sort of a human behavior model that was learned from traffic data. So I want to, uh, let me end up end here, but um, use this video to show you that um, this uh, idea of this framework is really like a pretty powerful one in the sense, the same idea can be used across different platforms from all different kinds of vehicles to manipulators. We also actually learn a barrier function for the manipulator to jointly work on the same object without collisions. Uh, everything I talked about today is, um, is uh, in this GitHub uh, repository called Certral Certified Control. I will send you the slides um, at the uh, after the talk, so you have this QR code, so you have the link. Um, that's all. So I wanted to hopefully I convinced that convinced you that this neural based uh, neural certificate based approach sort sort of can combine the rigor in control theory and the effectiveness in data driven machine learning methods to give. Uh, as the method that can provide assurance at the same time handle the large scale systems. Thank you. Thanks.
I'm sorry for running a little bit late. All right. Let's move on to the next speaker, Chi Zhu. And uh, 